Hi, friends. It's I. I know I have not seen you in a while here on YouTube. And the reason for that is very simple. I have no bandwidth or time to get full length podcast episodes up to YouTube consistently. However, I am working on changing that. Um, I have someone coming on board to help out with YouTube. So thanks for hanging in there. Hey, this is another response video to uh, a podcast that Ali Stuckey did. I actually brought on Riley, who works with us on the back end with research, who's getting her master's focusing on things like Christian nationalism. And we unpack an episode that Ali Stuckey did with a reporter named Julie Kelly, who I compare to being an Alex Jones level um, uh, reporter when it comes to the rhetoric that she espouses, especially about January 6th. So in this episode, Ali brings on Julie to talk about how A, the Capitol Police instigated the insurrection, essentially, how they were the cause of most of the violence and how the political, uh, I'm sorry, how the, the suspects arrested in the insurrection are actually political prisoners of war, essentially. This is a new low for Ali. This is straight up propaganda. So we had to respond to it. This episode is long. This is part one. But Whenever you have a fire hose of information being thrown at you, you have to take your time to unpack it. So we did. We went through line by line and kind of just said, is this true? What are we finding? So this is our response. This is part one to, to our uh, take on Ali's take, which I call trash in this video, mm -hmm. on January 6th. A couple of things to keep in mind. Number one. I mis mislabeled and misnamed a James Cone book that I recommended. The name of the book is Black Theology and Black Power, not Black Power and Black Liberation. So that's a mistake on my end. Number two, there were a few technical glitches where audio cuts out. Don't know why that happened. I apologize in advance. Um, it doesn't change anything. It's not It's not minutes of, of missing audio, just a few seconds here and there. Uh, this one is long, but like I said, we have to be able to go through this piece by piece to understand what's being said. And number four, I'm sorry if I ramble a little bit, okay? I'm working up at being a better communicator. I feel like I fumble over my words all the time. I feel like I'm always saying, um, this, that, the other thing. I'm working on that, okay? But if I ramble on this episode, just have some grace. That being said, it's great seeing you back on YouTube. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Um, please share it if you can. You can support us in the links below and we'll go from there. Have a good one. All right. Well, I don't do a whole lot of these these days because as you're going to find out to the audience and Riley already knows this, this is a very tedious thing to do. But um, I you sent me this, I think, Riley, this episode from Allie. Yep. And we're like, um, yeah, we might want to talk about that. So before I, <laughs> I go any further, let me just say this is Allie. Allie is working with us on the back end for research purposes and kind of helping us out with content. And Riley, you're studying abroad right now, right? I am. Yes, I am in London getting my master's degree. I'm about two months away from my master's degree in international relations. Uh, amazing. Well, it's super cool to have you on this episode um, or like this response video. And my audience knows I have done a response video before to Allie, but this one, it is very concerning. Um, it's very concerning. Do you want to maybe, actually, Riley, I would like to kind of hear your thoughts on, on why you even thought it was worth us taking several hours out of our day to listen through several times, fact check, and then actually record this. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I have heard a lot of downplaying over the past year and a half since January 6th. So this podcast is from Ali is specifically about January 6th and I've heard a lot of downplaying. I've heard a lot of um, just kind of general disregard, but this podcast actively promotes an alternative conspiracy theory to this day. And so I think that's why it is so important to address um, because as we'll get into, it is not just trying to downplay it. It's not just trying to say like, oh, this was just a riot that got out of hand, which was kind of the general narrative I've, narrative I've heard from the right up until this point. This was another take and it was a really dangerous take. And I just think that it's it's worth addressing. Yeah. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to warn you, friends, this episode's an hour and 12 minutes long. And one of the tactics I found from people like Ali or their guests is that they'll just fire hose you with information. And by, by the time you try and fact check something, they're on to the next thing. We're going to be as methodical as possible here. And we're, we're really going to try and, and ask, okay, wait, there's a statement. 
Let's look up and see what actually happened because there's so much here. The other thing I want to mention is that we're not here to dehumanize Allie or her guest, Julie, but we are here to really hold them accountable because Allie loves to talk about her Christian faith, objective truth, how the Bible is objectively accurate. Um, and, and you're going to find that like it's so hard to believe someone who says that who also brings on someone like Julie to essentially, I would argue, espouse almost Alex Jones level conspiracy theories um, about the January 6th insurrection as the January 6th committee is actively you know, um, um, uh, presenting their case to the American public. Like this is not just some random coincidence. This is planned. And so we have to go through it. So without further ado, Riley, you get to hit, hit start. I'm ready. Now, Riley, obviously I have control and you don't. So if you need me to pause, just yell or something. I don't know. And I'll, I'll pause so you can respond. And like I, <laughs> like I said, friends, we'll try and we'll try and let her speak as much as possible. But you're going to see they say so many things. So we'll try and catch what we can. Can't catch it all. But here we go. Greatness. She has been reporting. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie for a discount. That's GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. That's free promotion. I should, I should build them. <laughs> okay, guys, today, as promised, we are talking to Julie Kelly. She is a reporter at American Greatness. She has been reporting on January 6th, really since January 6th, 2021. And she has been one of the only voices that is trying to uncover what really happened that day and the Justice Department's response that she will demonstrate today, she will argue today, has been anything but just. So I just finished having the conversation, guys, and I am so incensed. I mean, I just have a pit in my stomach about everything that's going on. I've known a little bit from following her, but man, she is going to reveal some information about what happened that day that I did not know. What she suspects really instigated what happened that day, which I I, I just didn't realize some of the things that she put forth. And then also um, what the people who have been involved in January 6th have gone through for the past year and a half. And guys, here's why we have to care about this. And we'll talk about this in our conversation. No matter where you land on the political aisle, no matter what you think happened that day, whether you think it was something that just got out of hand, you know, it started out peacefully and then some people went crazy, some people were peaceful, or whether you believe what the mainstream media says about it being a coup attempt, a violent insurrection that was provoked by Donald Trump. Whatever you think about that, can we just agree that justice should be impartial? That we don't want the Justice Department going after people because of their political affiliation? Can we all agree that we should be a country that upholds someone's due process rights, no matter their ideology, no matter what they think about the integrity or the lack of integrity of an election? Like, should, shouldn't we just agree on that? Shouldn't we agree that justice should be proportionate to the crime that's committed? Shouldn't we agree that maybe some people that didn't even commit any kind of violent crime on January 6th shouldn't serve a longer time in prison than people who say murdered a child? Because that's what's going on. What we are seeing inflicted on the people who are involved in January 6th is disproportionate vengeance against American citizens because of their political affiliation. Okay, I have to pause it really quick. So what Ali is doing is she's setting up this idea of, guys, I'm not a far right political commentator. I am <laughs> a reasonable person. And don't, wouldn't you agree with me when I present to you this statement that it sounds reasonable? Now, of course, Ali doesn't believe this as we're going to uncover throughout the episode. I won't spoil all of your work there, you know, Riley, on, on what you have to <laughs> say. But it, it is important to recognize mm -hmm. that that Ali is all of a sudden um, very much a both and person about the insurrection. Oh, you know, hey, we don't have objective data about that. I mean, maybe you see it one way or another way. It, it, it's really, you know, it's really um, the flip of uh, the flip of, of a coin. Uh, who knows? Now, right. all you know, now that's Ali's new posture. Forget her objective statements about or um, her objective truth statements or how you know progressives are just objectively not good. Whatever it is, now it's all about both andism. It's the moderate approach. So very interesting to watch really the shift happened as she presents I, this case. I totally agree. And I know we're going to get into this later, but I just, 
I have so much to say on just initially her whole idea of disproportionate punishment. Mm. Um, there's just a lot there. So yeah, put a pin in that, friends, if you're listening or watching. I am saying this. You'll hear me say this with Julie. I am saying this as someone who, when I saw footage of what was going on on January 6, 2021, I sobbed. And some of you who maybe that wasn't your reaction, maybe you think that that's dramatic. But it was really hard for me to see that. It was really hard for me to see that kind of aggression. I mean, it really just seemed like everything was crumbling in that moment. I was saddened. I was frightened. I was heartbroken by what I saw happening in some cases on January 6th. So you are not hearing this conversation from someone who is trying to minimize what happened that day or someone who is condoning violence at all or someone who um, is trying to condone or minimize anyone who was trying to overturn an election. That's not what this is about. Okay. Really quick, just want to mention that um, Allie knows her base, which is why she's so careful to be so around the bush with this, right? Like she's trying mm -hmm. to essentially say like, I was really mad and upset over what happened, watching people storm the Capitol building and trying to overthrow the election. But she can't say that because she knows a lot of people in her base don't think that way. And she has to continue <laughs> to kind of toe the line of like far right, radical, honestly, conspiratorial nonsense. Oh, absolutely. And also saying how she actually feels as a human being. And maybe that's why I get so frustrated with Allie is that she has these moments where I'm like, I'm so glad to hear, Allie, that you cried because I was with you. I was also weeping over what happened, you know, yes, but I'm but then but then she pivots back to, you know, some people doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm not here to say that, you know, if people were trying to overthrow the, uh, the election, that 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 was a good thing. But then she'll deny all of it in, in this episode. So yep. all right. you are hearing from you are hearing this from someone who who is very clear eyed. And very, <laughs> I think, uh, even handed word. about what is going on and Jesus. recognizes that how the people, especially the nonviolent people who are involved in January 6th, how they're being treated is unjust and says something really, really scary about the state of our country. I think every single person, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, should care about this, that we do not have a just justice system in this country. And mm -hmm. Julie Kelly has been one of the only, not the only, but one of the only people who has been sounding the alarm about this, who she, you will not hear her either condone violence or say that no one should have been prosecuted that day. That's not what this is about. This is about believing in justice. This is about believing in someone's due process rights. As Christians, as we've talked about many times, there are there four characteristics to biblical justice. Yes. It has so to be much truthful. to say about that. So it has to be based on facts that happen, yeah, not sure. just something that you feel. Not Go ahead. I mean, one theme, and I don't want to spoil the podcast, but one theme that she will talk about the entire time is that we do not have a quote, just justice system. And she refers to it later on multiple times as basically two justice systems. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I agree, right. but not in the same way. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and I have so many facts to back that up, but we can, we can get that. We can get there. Okay. So oh, Allie, Allie is now painting the picture that, 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 that there are four, I'm assuming she would say objective truths that are, that define biblical justice. And she's about to rattle them off. Yep. someone's uh, political status or socioeconomic status, it actually needs to be truthful. The facts of the case, evidence has to be presented, and there need to be witnesses to be able to substantiate the allegation against someone in a, in a court of law. It needs to be, the punishment needs to be proportionate. So it needs to, the punishment needs to fit the crime. It also needs to be direct. So punishing people who are actually involved in committing the crime, and not people who were associated with someone who committed the crime, not the parents of someone who committed the crime, not the friend of someone who committed the crime, but someone who actually committed the crime. So it has to be truthful, has to be proportionate, it has to be direct. And then according to scripture and what we see in God's law giving to Israel. Really quick, I have to say that even her statement about it has that, that really only the person who the um, only the person who did the crime gets punished isn't even a scriptural thing. I mean, entire families, one family gets swallowed up by the, by the earth because the father no. like stole some <laughs> items. And you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, this whole idea of biblical is like, it's like, which verses are you talking about, Allie? Like, like where's, where do you exactly. get this idea from? 
Where do you we're get not it a from? theocracy, and we're not supposed. Our law is not supposed to be directly pulled out of the Old Testament. That would Thank be God. terrible for all of us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Throughout uh, Leviticus, in particular, oh, it good. also has to be impartial. Don't so that is something that God emphasized. Law, yeah, is over and over again that the justice process has to be impartial. So you don't show partiality to the person with a lot of power and a lot of money. You don't show partiality towards the person who you see, she as, our justice or who system. You see as poor. <laughs> you have to speak the truth about your neighbor. And actually someone who testified, who gave false testimony against a person who was accused, if it is found out that that person gave a, a false account a false testimony against the accused that person has to receive the punishment that would have been inflicted on the person who was accused so a false accuser also was punished in the old testament in that so is she advocating for that like in our legal system now you know like if someone exactly. if someone bears false testimony about a murder should that person then be put to death is that is that like the logic because this is biblical justice like it just this whole argument once you start thinking about it outside of like her reformed fundamentalist outlook the theologically nope. it just crumbles it crumbles exactly. it's it was selective- not supposed to be a copying and paste kind of judicial yeah. system and, and also a selective copy and pasting ali would never advocate Absolutely. for the year of jubilee in america american <laughs> you know economics right? right like oh every seven years let's forgive all the debt she let's would never advocate work. for that right anyway uh, we're only six minutes in jesus <laughs> that is whether you're a christian or not that is what our justice system is supposed to be founded on in general the <laughs> principles that the bible lays out for justice oh it has created the best system in the world and yet because of oh. ideology because of godlessness because of injustice <laughs> and wickedness as we will we talk, still have to capital punishment. talk about today that justice We're system like has been the perverted in the united states we will give basically. several <laughs> examples right. of that today this is something you should care about something you should care about i don't care where you are politically. I don't care what you think about Julie Kelly. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you think about Donald Trump. I don't care where you land on this. This is yes, something you, you should care, you care about. about and things. I am offering you a perspective that you're not going to hear in the mainstream media. Oh, here it is. You're not going to hear from most commentators. So maybe you disagree with some things that are said today, but at least open your mind and realize there is another side about this. There's another side of this that we need to know about and care about. Before we get into that conversation, Jesus. let me tell you about our first sponsor of the day. No. Rewards program. Sheen already... All right. So so the stage has been set. OK, Ali is giving you a different side of the uh, a different perspective than what the mainstream media is going to give you. And she's doing it by bringing on Julie Kelly, who writes for the um, uh, website American Greatness. That, is, that doesn't tell you where she lands on these things. And so now we're going to hear Julie's case for everything that Ali just said. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. I know a lot of people who are listening, watching, already follow you. But for those who don't, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Sure, Ellie. Thanks so much for having me on. So uh, I am a opinion writer, reporter, commentator. All my work can be found at American Greatness, amgreatness.com. I also have a book out about January 6th, how the Democrats have turned the Capitol protest into a war of ter- on terror against the political right, which I know we'll talk a little bit about now. Um, and so Quite I've been claim. covering this issue really since the day after it happened. And Ellie, I can just tell you, I know we'll talk about, I am absolutely shocked um, at how Democrats, the media, never Trumpers, et cetera, are exploiting the events of that day um, to go after the political right from Donald Trump all the way down to American voters who really did nothing wrong that day, mm, um, but to wrong. silence oh uh, political dissent, <laughs> yeah. criminalize political dissent, yep, yep. and of course cover up what uh, many people suspect was a rigged 2020 presidential election. Okay, so so there it is, right? So these were just innocent people walking down the street and Joe Biden's DOJ just rallied them up and said, did you vote for Trump? We're going to imprison yep. you. I mean, that's what you're led to believe. So I, I mean, the if, fact that yeah. she the fact that she is like leading, starting this off by saying, quote, these people did nothing wrong. I, I, right. I, it's mind blowing. Right. And also that, you know, that the 22 or the 2020 election was stolen. She's repeating that as well. Again, don't forget. The hearings, as of this recording, the hearings of the January 6th committee are coming out, and they are damning. I mean, they are so damning. The evidence is so overwhelming. You would have to have your head in the sand or be someone like Julie who just has a narrative in their head 
that 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 in my mind just completely defies reality. And I hope that we'll be able to prove that uh, during this response. Yep. Now, your work obviously far predates January 6, 2021. And yet a lot of people know you exclusively for your reporting on January mm-hmm. 6. Tell us why this has kind of become one of your main beats over the past year and a half. So I get this question a lot and I often think, what did I do to deserve this? Um, But uh, as you know, Allie, and I was working with your colleague Steve for over a year on the lockdown, uh, you know, the the inhumane lockdown policies, we were early opponents of that. And so I really was covering a lot of that, the (laughs) pandemic and then the lockdown policies and then sort of started covering (laughs) election fraud after the uh, 2020 election. So I guess, Ellie, what I saw on January 6th, I did not have the same reaction that almost everyone did. I thought the hype, the descriptions about what happened were so overblown. I was very suspicious about everyone suddenly using this word insurrection starting that day when the American people didn't even really fully understand what was happening. It just seemed like an orchestrated operation to me. Um, and so I started covering it the day after. And Ellie, what really shocked me was- Okay, hold on. I just have to say, we have so much video evidence. There's been, there's been impeachment hearings. There's been committee hearings. There's been reporting that is so extensive. I mean, people in their own words, why they're at the Capitol building. What, they're trying to hang Pence. Where's Pelosi? They're knocking on doors. There is, I mean, it, the, the evidence is insurmountable. And I'm not talking about, te- about witness testimony. We're talking about right. video evidence. Like there is terabytes of Absolutely. video evidence and their words. I mean, we, we literally, there, there was a, a- makeshift gallo at the United States Capitol, and they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. So if that in and of itself does not tell you everything you need to know about that day. Right, right. And I, I think that it's 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 important to realize the amount of gaslighting yep. that, and I'm not, I'm not even going to say conservative, because as this, this committee hearing is showing me, there are good conservatives who are standing on principle. Like, honestly, yep. Mike Pence, Thank God for Mike Pence. Never thought I would say that, but it's clear that 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 Absolutely. that Trump pressured him immensely to to do something illegal, and he didn't. So I'm going to say Trump supporters and Trumpers, right? You you would you would have to you're in the land of, of delusion here. I mean, it's it's crazy with the amount of gaslighting that we're going to see come from Julie uh, and from people in these circles. Absolutely, and even like on sorry, even on the whole oh, okay. the the January sixth committee, the the witness testimony predominantly has been from the conservative right. <laughs> right. So it really right. is just an example of radicalization. Yes. Um, yeah. Anyway. That, no, that, that's an astute point. The Justice Department seek what is called pretrial detention, meaning denying bail to protesters, including those who never entered the Capitol, never engaged in any violence, but basically accusing them of being insurrectionists and traitors, a danger to their community, and judges actually signing off and keeping nonviolent people behind bars. This, of course, happened on the heels of extremely violent, destructive, deadly riots that lasted for months. The American people were told were peaceful, despite what we saw before our very eyes. Um, People like Kamala Harris jumping to their defense to bail them out. Um, And of course, seeing so many perpetrators, rioters, not even facing charges. And so- Okay, we, we let's just uh, let's just do this segment now. I, I want to destroy this myth that we hear all the time. Well, the BLM riots, the Black Lives Matter riots, they were, they were so violent and so bad. Okay, I have data on this. I will do my best to put every link that we talk about here in our show notes. But according to a study done by the um, ACLE, which actually I'm going to open the link here and take a look. Uh, they specialize. Um, in this, they are, what's the name of this? Like, what does it stand for? I looked it up today, but I lost it. Um, let's see. Um, man, all I see is her acronym. Hold on one second. I'm going to look this up. Um, uh, this might be a good editing moment. <laughs> the armed conflict location and event data project. So they track all conflicts. They're not just talking about, about BLM. They do a ton of research here. Okay. According to them, 
And this was also backed up by a study in, uh, done by Harvard. Approximately 94% of all pro BLM de demonstrations have been peaceful with 6% involving reports of violence, clashes with police, vandalism, looting, or other destructive activity. In the remaining 6%, it is not clear who instigated the violence or looting, um, 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 having been provoked by demonstrators, other events, Sorry, let me just redo that. I can't talk today. While some cases of, of uh, violence or looting have been provoked by demonstrators, other events have escalated as a result of aggressive government action, intervention from far right wing groups, or individual assailants in car ramming attacks. In contrast, demonstrations involving right wing militias or militant social movements have turned violent or destructive over twice as often or nearly 14% of the time. Okay. And when intervening, the uh, and, and forces involved, they are more likely to use force against pro BLM demonstrators. This is the police are talking about 52% of the time compared to 20 26% of the time against all other demonstrators. One other thing I want to mention here is that there, um, they um, have found, and this evidence and data was, was based on over 7,000 events. So wow. we all know the George Floyd protest. I believe it holds the world record for the largest protest, even mm -hmm. globally. And the yeah. U.S. was certainly no exception. And yes, obviously there is damage. There are estimated between one, one to $2 billion in property damage. But as far as, as, as death and as far as violence percentage-wise, nothing compared to what one day at the Capitol building provoked. And also, might I mention, now I'll give it over to you in a second, Robbie, I can see your chomp at the bit here. People <laughs> protesting and demonstrating for justice against a police state that, that, that historically has marginalized the black community mm. is a very different motivation than thinking that, oh, the election was stolen because the sitting president has fed me bullshit lies. And now I have to go to the Capitol building while they're in session claiming to try and, and, and attempt to hang Mike Pence and to stop our election process. One is based in injustice. One is based on a straight up lie. I totally agree. I don't really have a whole lot to add other than just the fact that these are apples and oranges and trying to compare them is just a logical fallacy because on the one hand, you have systemic oppression and systemic injustice, which resulted in the largest civil rights movement since the 1960s. Yeah. Um, and that is just incredible. Yeah. On the other hand, you have what I feel comfortable calling a fascist coup on democracy. Mm -hmm. And so to to try and compare these things is one insensitive, but also is just logically baseless. Yeah, and I found that this is what people in these circles tend to do is they'll try and they already have a story in their head and their job is to try and find facts to fit that story, right? So in this case, context doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why the BLM protests happened, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is that, oh, uh, protest, oh, this is a protest too. We'll just compare it. Also, one last thing I want to mention, as far as I'm aware, according to this data I have, it looks like there were five people total who died in the in the uh, in the glo in the national protest uh, during the George Floyd protesting, including one anti-fascist protester who killed a far right group member during a confrontation in Portland. But law enforcement killed the alleged assailant several days later. So hmm. I mean, even this idea of like, oh, it, Antifa is trying to do all this damage. It happened one time and that person lost his life to law sure. enforcement. He was killed. So. Hmm. All right. We'll keep on going here. But whew, how to get that out there? I thought I just saw this huge disparity uh, in how both events were being handled in our criminal justice system and still to this day, a huge disparity double standard. And so I think that that's really my very first article um, about a political prisoner was on February 4th of 2021. And that was the Justice Department seeking to incarcerate Cooey Griffin, uh, a man who didn't even enter the Capitol, was on allegedly restricted grounds and prosecutors tried to keep him behind bars and a judge actually going along with it for uh, several days before another judge intervened and released him. Wow. Okay, so let's, so let's pause right there because she just, she just dropped the name. This is Cooey Griffin. According to CNN, an article that was only a few months old, he's the founder of a group Cowboys for Trump and he's charged with two misdemeanor offenses for his alleged actions during the attack, entering and remaining in a restricted area in disorderly and disruptive conduct. He chose to be tried by Judge Trevor McFadden, who will hear arguments from prosecutors and defense before ruling instead of a jury. So, you know, again, this idea that like, oh, this poor guy just like got, you know, he's just being 
being wrongly imprisoned. No, he was obviously picked up. He chose a certain judge. He had rights. He's not dead. Okay. Like George Floyd, for example, if we're going to compare apples and oranges, he's having a process as we speak, or um, I should say he's, he's, he's in legal process as we speak. And I really just push back against this idea of a quote, political prisoner um, for so many reasons, but that is just kind of a persecution complex, if you will, in this situation. (laughs) Also, not to try and prove my point more, but uh, Griffin is also an ex-pastor. So I'm just saying there's so much there's so much Christian Christian language in, in, in w- w- with these people. There's so much Christian nationalism happening here, and that's not going to be talked about. We're only concerned about, about this perceived idea that, you know, the DOJ is being unfair or unjust, which there could be some elements to that, but taken out of context. Right. Go back to January 6th. This isn't something that we have covered super thoroughly. Now, when it mm-hmm. happened, we had Steve Dace on and he had maybe a similar reaction to you. Um, it wasn't the same reaction that we saw a lot of people have. I'll just be honest. When I first <laughs> saw the footage of what happened on January 6th, I cried and it it, it was it was almost my reaction almost surprised me I think because of everything that had been leading up to that point it did seem like we were kind of in a pressure cooker type situation because of mm-hmm. the lockdowns because of covid because of this contentious election because of the riots and the violence that we had seen just uh, wreck right. American cities because of BLM and I mean it was just a tense moment and then it just seemed like things just boiled over. Right. It's it, it wasn't Trump talking about baseless election fraud narratives. It wasn't the right wing media promoting these baseless narratives. It right. wasn't anything like that at all. It was definitely covid and the riots or the protests, whatever you want to call them. You know, it's definitely all Black Lives Matter's fault for sure. Trump had nothing to do with this insane exactly. narrative that we were pushing. And I think it's just important to mention the timeline here. Right. We had I think it's what November 5th was when we all cast our ballots right and then this is january 6 almost two months of consistent lies from donald trump that is going to do something yes and also charlie kirk i mean all of them they even the most extreme non-election fraud person like at the time was ben shapiro still definitely (laughs) not shutting it down very much an entertainer of such ideas right absolutely but don't worry it's all blm's fault (laughs) and I was sad to see what I saw. Of course, I did see the people who were just entering in, walking through. You saw grandmothers with American flags. Where? Just I want proof. Like mosey who through saw the Capitol. that? But then who? you did hold on, see. Hold on. Okay, this is crazy. Allie is saying that during an insurrection where the Capitol was, was sieged or attempted to be sieged, People were just walking through peacefully. Are you kidding me? It was during an insurrection. There's You're trespassing on federal property. There were barricades everywhere saying you can't go this far because they knew protests were going to erupt. They, Allie paints a picture like it was a normal business day. I was in the tourist section of the <laughs> Capitol building and all of a sudden the government just arresting right. people and, and there's grandmas there with flags. Where's the proof, Allie? Like, honestly, if you're going to make I've that kind of claim, that. I have never seen a picture of a grandmother no. with an American flag in the Capitol building during an insurrection. I would love I have to watched see it. Hours though. of footage of this insurrection. I'm writing my dissertation on this insurrection and never once have I seen quote grandmothers walking through the Capitol leisurely. Right. No. And this is why I know we're stopping so often, but this is the fire hose. They just say things. There's yeah. no evidence, no data. It, they just say it. And therefore it must be true. No, no, there's no evidence of this. Yep. Violence. You saw people who were really angry, who were really vicious, who were pushing down barricades, who were yes. pushing back against police officers, who were trying to break their way into the Capitol. Is your contention <sighs> mostly that the people who were violent and the people who were nonviolent are all being treated the same? Or are, are you saying kind of like the violence that we did see is being overblown by the media or what's what's really your big beef and how this is being handled? So there certainly were people who acted badly that day and should be prosecuted for what they did. There's not a mob, right? Notice the language shift. There's no mob mm-hmm. here. Just a few bad apples acting badly, badly. OK, yep. OK. Keep that in mind, friends. No, uh, excusing people who overran, especially the first police lines um, and attempted to get into the building uh, aside from police who were there trying to protect it. However, Allie, what we haven't seen 
And what this committee and DOJ refuses to allow the American people to see are thousands of hours of surveillance video cap that captured what happened inside and outside the building that day. And here's why. The confrontations that most Americans saw between police and protesters, what happened was police provoked a lot of the violence that happened that day. This is why, Allie, and this is hard for people to grasp, and I understand that. This is why Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and Muriel Bowser left the Capitol grounds intentionally unsecure that day. Okay, we got to stop. Does we she know stop. that Mitch McConnell is like a far right Republican? <laughs> okay, so let's fact check this. According to the AP News, the decision on whether to call National Guard troops to the Capitol is made by what is known as the Capitol Police Board, which is made up of the House Sergeant at Arms, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, and the Architect of the Capitol. The board decided not to call the Guard ahead of the insurrection, but eventually did request assistance after the rioting had already begun and the troops had arrived. So, a little more context to this. Um, Donald, there are, is a document that came out that's saying that that Donald Trump's Pentagon offered to give them um, uh, offered to give the Capitol Police um, uh, um, the National Guard. Uh, I think three days before the insurrection actually happened, they said no. Okay, and they said no, and then they ended up kind of looping back. And saying, well, maybe, but that wasn't at, that wasn't Pelosi or Mitch McConnell pulling strings. They obviously aren't. They're not going to be right. involved in the day to day of what the Capitol Police do on any given day. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense to imagine that there's some kind of grand conspiracy here because it doesn't it, it, it doesn't exist. And this is what they do. They'll take a little bit of fact like there is some truth to that statement. Then they twist it and boom, there's your narrative. Oh, look, Pelosi and McConnell, they they told the guard to stand down. No, that's not what happened. And also, one last thing I want to mention is she met, she says that it's hard for the American people to believe what she's saying. Yes, because it's propaganda. Like, where is the evidence of, of the thousands of hours of surveillance footage showing police instigating violence? And man, I mentioned it's impossible for that to happen because the police did not go to where Trump was speaking and start beating people over the head. Right. That that would be inciting violence. No, people went to the Capitol building, broke through barriers, broke windows, broke doors, stormed the damn building, and then police had to hold certain control points and yep. violence ensued because they were attacked. Yep, absolutely. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just like I just can't believe that Ali Stuckey is platforming this. She has 400,000 followers on Instagram. She's seen as a good, godly Christian, loves John MacArthur. And we're supposed to believe that like that you're sincere in this? This is ridiculous. Well, and I just want to say too, like for transparency's sake, I did try and fact check some of what she said. Um, and I could not find anything. I really could not. So I, I don't know where she necessarily got some of this from, but it it was I definitely think the she, far corners of so, the internet. So I sent you that documentary, like what really happened on January 6th, which we'll get into a little bit later on. And Ooh, even that, that own footage, it, it betrays their own narrative. Like it yep. shows violent protesters trying to attack police and police fighting back. They're like, look, mm. police brutality. They're instigating it. It's like, are you kidding me? Like we have the video footage. Yeah. All right. Whew. It's really important to underscore Donald Trump was not responsible for securing the U.S. Capitol that day. He has no jurisdiction over that. Hmm. That completely no, rests in the hands. Also, a president can deploy the guard at their discretion. So but again, fine. Well, we can roll with that. Of the U.S. Capitol Police, who are under the direction of the sergeant at arms for both Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell that day and also Muriel Bowser. Why did they continue to deny requests from the Capitol Police Chief for thousands of guardsmen to be on Capitol grounds that day? What? Um, just want to mention that that there is another story saying that um, with Pelosi in particular, when she was asked, should we send troops in uh, like later, later on in the day? She said yes. So, again, I don't know where she's getting this information from. This mm-hmm. idea that Pelosi is like, no, let it burn. I mean, that's what Trump was saying. And again, we have committee hearing um, our committee testimony from Bill Barr and others who were who, that, that Trump said that we have evidence. Right. But there's no evidence that Pelosi or whoever was saying, no, no, don't send them in. It's fine. Through my book and other reporting, it is because DC Metro and Capitol Police had their marching orders to start attacking the crowd outside, doing nothing wrong. These were people who started coming from Trump's speech, attacking them with uh, non-lethal munitions, stun grenades, uh, flashbangs, 
uh, sting balls with rubber bullets, pepper balls, and tear gas to provoke a lot of the confrontations. That's why you see Trump supporters screaming at police officers, calling them traitors. This is such Because propaganda. that is what police were doing that day. That's a huge part Should of I the stop? story. Most Americans do not know. This committee has not explored. And we can't even see the video and the records uh, that would support or at least explain why these people, these people in charge, left the Capitol and the grounds so intentionally unsecured on January 6th. Wait, can we stop right there? Yeah. I just want to say, like, the whole idea of secret footage, secret recording, secret videos, if that is not yeah. conspiracy theory red flag number one, right? this right. idea of, like, secret videos that exist. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is. This is, this is honestly next level for Allie. I mean, I've, I've listened to quite a few of her podcasts. I, I'm shook. That, that, that this is who she had on. This is literally, I mean, this is Alex Jones level here. I mean, it, it only gets worse from here, friends, honestly. Do you believe the people that were pushing down the barricades and pushing back against the police officers, that they were provoked by the police officers and that that was an intentional setup by Muriel Bowser, Nancy Pelosi, the Democrats at the Capitol? All of a sudden, Mitch McConnell's out. So a second ago, Mitch McConnell was in. Thing. <laughs> All of a sudden, yep, he's just right. unscathed. Right, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, yeah, this lady says that that, that, that he stopped the, the troops from coming, but Ali is like, well, it's the Democrats' fault. I mean, okay, Ali. Right, the Democrats at the Capitol. So you have different things <laughs> right. happening at different parts of the Capitol grounds. The first breach, Ali, happened right before the joint session of Congress convened that day, right before 1 o'clock. And you see people like Ray Epps, was standing there, still not charged inexplicably. Why? Yeah, um, Ryan just, let's Sam pause so right there. That's an interesting part that some people yes, don't know about. about this. Um, and I don't yeah. want to get you off because I know you're telling us a no, timeline, but time. who is Ray Epps and why is this a name that we keep hearing? We still don't know who Ray Epps is. And I'm sure some of your listeners uh, understand that this is the man, tall man in a red MAGA hat. He's seen on January 5th and 6th directing people to go to the Capitol, telling them to go inside the Capitol building that day. He's on video numerous times doing this. He was right behind the man, Ryan Samsel, who first breached, not the Capitol building, but the perimeter of the grounds. You had a few Capitol Police there with these metal racks. In no way did it indicate that anything was off limits That's or at least it wasn't, for. you know, strongly enforced. Okay, so there we go. Really quick, I just want to mention this. You know, the, the, the metal racks don't enforce the boundary, but even if they did, like it wasn't strongly enforced. So it's not that big of a deal if they just blasted right past them. But really quick, friends, let's back up. Who is Ray Epps? Well, again, data, journalism, you know, whatever. And this is, this is publicly accessible. New York Times article, according to this, Ray Epps, just two days after the attack, Mr. Epps saw himself on a list of suspects from January 6th. He called an FBI tip line and told investigators that he had tried to calm Mr. Samsel down. That's who Julie just talked about, where she said that Ray was trying to tell him to go charge. No, his, his testimony is that he was trying to calm him down. Uh, according to three people who have heard a recording of the call, Mr. Epps went on to say that he explained to Mr. Samsel that the police outside the building were merely doing their jobs. Now, in late January of last year, in an interview with the FBI, Mr. Samsel corroborated this. He said the same exact thing. He said that he did not know this man, but he came up to him at the barricades and suggested he relax. And according to a recording of the interview obtained by the New York Times, quote, he came up to me and he said, dude, his entire words were relaxed. The cops are doing their job. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy forwarded. Now, this won't stop people from people from still reciting it. But again, if you didn't know the data, if you didn't know the actual story, you're led to believe, oh, my God, there's some really shady dude, maybe right. some kind of undercover you know, operative trying to instigate the insurrection. Maybe it's Antifa. No, no, no. Let me just put that to bed right now. That's the actual story. It's way well, less glamorous than that. And this has been debunked by so many news sources, not not just right here. <laughs> right, it's right. Been debunked yes. time and again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great point. Great point. But, you know, that's just the mainstream media with their liberal bias or something. Right. I don't know. Uh, this, <laughs> this perimeter, this barricade, it was a joke. And so it's you have joke. Ray Epps standing yeah. there. He whispers in order. the ear of Ryan Samsel, who then, with other people, including the Proud Boys, knocked down some of these barriers, these bike racks, basically, um, and run up these <laughs> stairs past police. 
This is the exterior grounds. This is not the building itself. And they advance towards the building. Now, this happens around one o'clock. Just crazy that she's really trying to tell us that the party of law and order and don't break the law and follow police orders. Back to blue. It's like, well, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, they, they, they weren't in the building yet. They just blasted by a police barrier, but it wasn't yep. really that well enforced and it wasn't really a big deal. I mean, it's just, wow. I mean, shocking to me. And again, not because of an injustice, not because someone's being murdered three steps away from them or something, right? But because they think that the that the election has been stolen. They've been, right. they, they bought into this lie. We can't emphasize that enough. Donald Trump is still speaking one and a half okay. miles away. He doesn't finish up until 110. So we can talk a little bit more about the timeline. Anyway, Ray Epps, still almost 18 months later, has not been charged with a crime. Some people suspect he has been a federal agent. Uh, the committee leapt to his defense, oddly, when senators started asking why he hadn't been charged. His name was removed from the FBI's most wanted list. But here we are, Ali, almost 18 months later. We still don't know why a man who was so intimate, it, you know, on multiple occasions involved in what happened that day on restricted grounds uh, at the point of the initial perimeter breach, why he has not been charged. And I mean, so this is just one of the many unanswered questions. It's an answered question. We just answered it. Yeah, I mean, seriously, if anyone listening to this is curious, just do a simple Google search. It has been debunked time and again. Like up and down. Uh, definitely an inconsistency. You would think if they are going to charge these people who were nonviolent, who just entered into the Capitol that day or were just in proximity, um, that they would certainly have charged this person who is seen on camera telling people to go to the Capitol and march to the right. Capitol. So look how Ali reinforces it. Right. Like Ali, right. Ali's viewers see her as someone who is has integrity, someone who has authority, someone who has influence. And she, there's no checking here. She doesn't ask for a source. She this lady for uh, Ali is the source. Right. Exactly. And so Ali just reinforces it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, wow. That's crazy. Ali, come on. Come on. You yeah, are a well-known uh, commentator. You have a team who feeds you bullet points. No one proofed this. I mean, it's 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 jaw dropping. Right. That is troubling. So troubling. Um, yes, troubling. continuing <laughs> on the timeline. So this was happening while President Trump was still speaking. And then how right. is President Trump involved in this? I know that there's been so much back and forth. Did he incite this? Did he push for this? Did he encourage people <laughs> to go to the Capitol and be it's violent? So moderate, course, this version of Ali. He is he has heard did saying he, he peacefully march or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or whatever. Again, like there's just so data. Right. All right. I, I, she takes one quote. Out of context, does not put anything else in context, does not talk about, about the January 6th committee hearings, but all the data from the president's inner circle telling the president, this is crazy, you can't do this, and I'm still doing it. Or the president's but, own Twitter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, I, you know, I, I don't want to rehash. I, I had a note to go over the committee, but that will take too long. Friends, all you have to, you know this. If you're listening to the podcast, you know that like that, that the committee's evidence is damning. You know that Trump absolutely had a role in this. Like there, there's so much evidence of this. To hear Ali and this lady try and downplay it is just, man, what world are we I in? Have, and just one one other note on President yeah. Trump and his role. It just when he heard that people were calling for Mike Pence to um, be killed, he said, yeah. quote, maybe he deserves it. Yes. So I just think that is a really important thing to highlight. This is his yes. own vice president. Absolutely. And we have, again, witness testimony. You can watch the whole hearing. It's available. Uh, yep. Controversy surrounding President Trump's role in this. Controversy. Jesus. Um, so as I said, that first breach happened uh, with the Proud Boys, people like Ray, Ray Epps, Ryan Samsel, who's been incarcerated now for 17 months um, while the DOJ continues to delay his trial. So he, so he was nonviolent. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. I'm just so interested. He, he was nonviolent, but he has been kept in prison. Is he in solitary confinement? Well, I wouldn't call him nonviolent because oh, he okay. did breach the barricades. He knocked over one police officer. Uh, he helped her back up. No, um, no, no. And so he's charged with assaulting a police officer, damage to property. So I wouldn't say that Ryan would be one of the uh, defendants who is nonviolent. There are at least a dozen plus who face nonviolent offenses, though, who have been incarcerated for over a year. Ryan's not necessarily one of them. Um, but this first group then is.
I just want to mention one thing, you know, Julie mentioned that this guy's been locked up for 17 months. One of the reasons why is when they checked to see if he had a criminal history, they found that he was out on parole from Pennsylvania Department of Corrections and that there's a warrant out for his arrest in Riverside. That's where I'm, that's my area, actually. It's, it's like three towns over uh, for an alleged assault in 2019. So the reason why he wasn't out on bail is because judges, obviously, we know this, judges have discretion to say, is this person a flight risk? Is this person dangerous to the community, et cetera? So it's it's not like, you know, again, the DOJ is just going around. Oh, well, randomly, well, we'll just throw you in jail. Yeah, we'll just wait. We'll throw you in jail. There's reasons behind the decisions that are made. Now, as we're going to talk later on, it's not always just I get that. But that's why this is so dangerous, right? Because it's taking a reality of truth that you and I would agree with and I've talked about, but it's flipping it on its head to really support, you know, a certain maybe white supremacist view. I don't know if we can say right. that now, but, you know, I'm, we're, we're kind of getting there. So, well, and I just want to kind of follow up on what you just said, especially what she has been saying, and I think continues to say throughout this podcast, she really harps on this term, quote, nonviolent. Mm. Um, and uh, since the war on drugs in the 1980s and 90s, the amount of POC who have been incarcerated for, quote, nonviolent offenses yep. is through the roof. Um, in 1982, the court upheld a 40-year sentence for um, a black man attempting to sell nine ounces of marijuana. And so it just this hypocrisy of caring about the proportionality of crimes uh, is just blatant. Yeah, that's good. Advances up to the west side of the Capitol. And there were scuffles with police and people were trying to get up these stairs to get closer to the building. And so there were definitely some violent agitators in there, too. There are certainly people who you could see on film who were agitators who still have not been charged. Because, of course, Ali, as we know, um, that first group that I just talked about, there were at least two FBI informants group to breach the Capitol. We still don't have the uh, number and amount and exactly what these FBI informants, I suspect hundreds, if not thousands of federal agents were involved. Mm. Uh, okay. We still can't get answers on that too. Um, but anyway, so- that. Hold on, hold on. That, again, another huge conspiracy, this idea that, that there were undercover FBI agents involved. Now she says informants, and we do have evidence that, that there was at least one Proud Boy informant, but that's not an FBI agent, okay? And, and the Proud Boy informant was texting, they call him a handler, like the person that he would report to. But there's absolutely no evidence that, that there were undercover FBI agents or or um, maybe authorized like um, like um, informants that were working for the government trying to like, I don't know, they kind of they kind of they kind of leave you thinking like, oh, like maybe they, they instigated like you know, what happened on January 6th. Again, just so there's no evidence of that besides the one informant at the rally who was working with the Proud Boys who texted his handler. And it was evident that his handler had no idea that the building was breached, according to this is from The New York Times as well. So, again, not the FBI. It was a civilian who was also an informant for the FBI, not thousands of them. <sighs> And Donald Trump finishes up his speech at the ellipse around 110. This is now after this initial breach. So you have thousands of people who start walking towards Capitol Hill. As you said, Ali, he said, you know, we want our voices heard. We are going to march peacefully. A lot of people who I've interviewed went to the Capitol thinking Donald Trump said he was going to be there. They thought he would go there and give another speech. Mm. Um, as they're walking towards the Capitol, and there's plenty of video evidence of this, you could see people being attacked outside, not just these agitators, but people who had assembled on Capitol grounds, they're waving flags, they're singing, they're sort of waiting, people didn't have cell service, so they were sort of waiting to see what Mike Pence was going to do, they were sort of waiting to see what was gonna happen with this audit that the Republican senators and uh, House members wanted, a 10 day audit. And so as they're approaching, they see Which all of illegal, this tear the gas. Way, they can hear clear. flashbangs can't going off. They see people bleeding from being attacked with rubber bullets by DC Metro and Capitol Police. Now, outside of the ones who were at first, the first set of agitators, there was no reason for Capitol Police and DC Metro to be throwing these uh, uh, explosive devices 
at the crowd of people who were just approaching Capitol grounds. And so this. Again, there's just no like there is evidence of people storming the barricades that were set up on Capitol grounds. The police right. were completely outnumbered. I mean, I, I'm not going to repeat this over and over again, because it, hopefully anyone who's, who's listening to this has seen the footage for themselves. But this idea that people with their lawn chairs and with their families were just walking up on like a normal day and all of a sudden, boom, a flashbang hits them. is right. just so it's disingenuous. It, yep. it is bullshit. It's crazy. Is when you see a lot of protesters Trump supporters, Biden protesters, I guess you will call them, screaming at police. Two men, Ali, Kevin Greeson and Benjamin Phillips, died of fatal heart attacks on Capitol grounds that day. This was before Ashley Babbitt was shot and killed by a Capitol police officer. They died of fatal heart attacks. Witnesses who were near the, these two men say they had cardiac events because they were hit with these flashbangs, mm. um, which emits this huge explosion of light and sound. These two men were carried off by protesters using bike racks as a stretcher. Mm. This is something most Americans have never heard. Okay, so first off, let's just be transparent and clear about this. Any loss of life, of course, is horrible. Okay, I don't, I don't want anyone dead. I didn't want anyone to pass away. Absolutely. Uh, you know, someone dying from a heart attack is is terrible. Of course, I completely understand that. But the framing of this is so disingenuous. The framing of this is they were just innocent people and uh, doing nothing wrong. And then a flashbang came out of nowhere. And then that triggered a heart attack. The mm -hmm. coroners both both said uh, for both these men that they, that they died of natural causes. So we're not sure what caused, um, um, you know, uh, the heart attack. It definitely could have been a flashbang for sure. But also, can we please acknowledge that 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 these are people who were were storming a Capitol building or who were at least involved in the mob that was doing that? And how do you get ambulances to those people when they're surrounded by by other people trying to push forward? It's impossible. So what I'm not trying to do is is say they deserved it. Of course they did not. They they no, no one deserves to die. Okay, but are there reactions for decisions that you make? That are that that when you put yourself in that kind of a situation, yes. And unfortunately, this happened. I wish we had ambulances available there, but how would you expect ambulances or anyone, even police, to give aid when you have people trying to hit them with rocks, sticks, tear gas, and trying to break down their defenses to get into the building? What do you do there? So I just have to, I have to mention that. Four people died on January 6th, not any police officers. Four Trump mm. supporters, Kevin Greeson, Benjamin Phillips, Ashley Babbitt, who was shot and killed almost at point blank range by Capitol Police officer Michael Byrd, and Roseanne Boylan, who died around 4.30 that afternoon, also as a result of excessive force by D.C. Metro and Capitol Police. OK, I just want to I just want to clarify, I have everything right here. Um, regarding what she's saying about who died the day of that, I believe is correct. As far as the days and weeks after the riot, right. five police officers who had served at the Capitol on January 6th died, several of them from suicide. Just keep that in mind. And Officer Brian uh, Sicknick died the day after January 6th. Yeah. So uh, maybe not yeah. on January 6th, but he died on January 7th. And um, and, and another officer died four days later. Right. And, and the only person to be killed by police directly is Ashley Babbitt, which we'll talk about later on. But you have Kevin uh, Greasy died of a heart attack while collapsing on the sidewalk west on the Capitol on January 6th. You have Roseanne Boylan, who appeared to have been crushed in a stampede of fellow rioters as they surge against the police. This is, again, from, from Washington Post. Um, and then you have Benjamin Phillips, the founder of a pro-Trump website. He died of a stroke. And it was found afterwards with the coroner that looks like um, – it looks like Miss Greason. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Mr. Greason. It looks like um, Roseanne, uh, Miss Boyle, was caused by an accidental overdose. Okay, so again, trying to make it seem like these deaths are because the Capitol Police were being violent, I just think is so not the case here, based on the best data that we have. Well, I mean, the data is literal video footage. Right. So you can observe it. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So I invite people to look at my reporting. I've embedded many videos that I have received from people um, who show what police were doing this day. This is a major cover-up by both DOJ and by the uh, J6 committee. They do not want Americans to see 
what law enforcement did that day, which is why they're concealing the videos and they're concealing all records and communications from Capitol Police, Nancy Pelosi, DC uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser's office, and certainly the FBI. Oh, we got that coming. Wow. But not Mitch McConnell, right? No. Evidence against him. Of course not Mitch McConnell. Of course not. Um, okay. Woo, break one. Woo. Woo. Okay. Yeah, I know. There's a lot here. Um, let's see. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good on time. I think we can go maybe to one more, one more uh, like uh, break that she does. If we can go from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far, it, it just it just is so... I would love your thoughts on this, Riley, honestly, because you have a different perspective than I do. But from my vantage point, I'm just like, wow, Allie, I can't believe that, that yeah. this is who you brought on to espouse in so many ways, either twisted or baseless propaganda and you're taking this person seriously like right. you're you're really taking them at face value as someone who is like giving you this this um this other perspective that again the bo- the boogeyman media is just trying to intentionally hide absolutely and i think one thing that struck me i mean we all watched january 6th we all saw it we all remember where we were when it happened yeah. and the ironic thing at least in my experience was that it was not very partisan in the days following. For the most part, yeah. most Republicans I talked to, I mean, my family, you know, friends that I have that are conservatives, um, pretty much everyone agreed that it was tragic. It was crazy and nobody wanted anything to do with it. Yeah. And so I have been shocked in the last, in, in the year and a half. And, and honestly, in the past week, Yep. Since the committee hearings started airing, just how partisan it has become. And the, the thing I just keep going back to is that it would have been in Republicans' best interest to denounce what happened that day. Why on earth are they trying to to support it or trying to defend it? And I don't want to lump all Republicans in because obviously um, I think Liz Cheney is incredibly brave. Yep. And I think Mike Pence was incredibly brave. Yep. And in many ways, we owe the preservation of our democracy to both of them. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and so if it, assuming there are Republicans out there that disagree with what happened on January 6th, that's great. As far broadly speaking, though, with Fox News and Tucker Carlson and their audience, I've just been shocked at the changing of the narrative um, that I've seen. And I think it's really dangerous and really scary for the future of our democracy. I agree. All right. Let me tell you about our second sponsor for the day. No. A lot of people know about this. All right, here we go. It's a catchy little jingle. It's really amazing how little a lot of people know about this. I mean, there are people who may not even identify as liberal, so they're not necessarily watching MSNBC or CNN, but who believe that the police officers were murdered. I mean, we've heard the Biden administration say that. That. Well, I mean, we ready to we ready to discuss this. You know, like what happened on January sixth caused several of them to take their own life. So, uh, it's, it's well, and one of them was. I mean, the one who died on January seventh died right not by suicide. Right. True. Joe Biden has said it. Right. And as you said, the only person who was killed that day was Ashley Babbitt. As far as we know, she was unarmed. That police officer who shot and killed her was actually given a glowing interview. I believe it was on NBC or ABC. I mean, when is the last time a police officer shot and killed an unarmed person and got anything but condemnation? Uh, Can we stop there? Because I have an answer to her question. Oh, great. Um, January 2022, actually. So she asked, when was the last time that an officer killed an unarmed person? Let me see. I have it here in my notes. Um, Sorry, we might have to (laughs) edit this a bit. Sorry about this. Uh, No problem. Okay. Jeffrey Hash, Officer Jeffrey Hash, killed Jason Walker in January and has not yet been arrested. This is January 2022. That's the last time that a police officer shot an unarmed person and has not been um, in any way held accountable for it that we know. Hmm. Um, so just, there's, just to there's... answer her question factually. Right. From these mainstream media outlets, this also mm-hmm. reminds me that in May of 2020, mobs of left-wing writers, this was brought up recently by Andy No, tried to storm the White House. They were pushed back mm-hmm. by the police. These left-wing writers 
tried to assault the police officers, hit them with projectiles. And of course, the Democrats and the leftists at the time condemned law enforcement for right. pushing them back. And again, I think this is some, this is something I didn't even remember. And I'm someone who pays attention to the news. So there's almost no hope for that. OK, here we are. Doom and gloom. So let's address two quick things. Number one, I wanted to mention that, um, again, context absolutely matters. That's why people protest unjustifiable police shootings of unarmed people. OK, now, yep. once again, I want to be very clear. Ashley Babbitt, I did not want her to die. Okay. I know. I don't, I don't even think that, that in a way she deserved it. Okay. However, when you are storming a federal building and you're trying, you're and you're part of a mob that's trying to hang the vice president. And on the other side of, of a person who is, who is, whose duty is to protect the politicians who are trying to make our process work, right? When that person has a gun to your face and says, you need to stop coming through because I have to protect who I'm here to protect and I'm telling you to stop. And then you get shot, okay? Does that mean, like what I'm trying to say is that like, it is justifiably understandable why that officer made that decision in that moment, given the circumstances. It completely Absolutely. makes sense, okay? Because again, federal building, um, trying to overturn a, a legitimate election process. Politicians are a few, are a few feet away in the, on, on the other side of the door. He has a job to do, and he's giving you plenty of chances to not do what you are doing. Yep, absolutely. Also, just back to her question, because I think it's so honestly insensitive. Um, just the idea that like, she said, when is the last time a, an officer shot and killed an unarmed person and got anything other than condemnation from the mainstream media? Hmm. I, the only reason that people like Derek Chauvin have been charged is because of the largest civil rights movement since the 1960s, is because of a massive outcry that happened in the streets, that happened on social media. This did not come from some noble justice system. Yep. So so yep. I just want to, she's painting our justice system as if it favors the left. Right. And that's just fundamentally untrue. Yeah. Great point. I also wanted to mention, she's talking about this uh, protest thing in May. Uh, I have a whole story on this. I'll try and share the link. Yeah, here's the details. Crowds that were protesting the killing of George Floyd clashed with U.S. Secret Service and Park Police and D.C. police officers in the nation's capital. This is in May 2020. Um, and uh, the second outburst of violent confrontations less than 24 hours. Um, by nightfall, nearly a thousand protesters were circling the perimeter of the White House grounds, which was fortified with law enforcement vehicles, metal barriers and rows of armored secret service so already this is more a, a more fortified situation than what we have and we also right. know that in in history there have been violent protests before um sweating and packed closely together and shouting through masks worn to protect themselves from the coronavirus the protesters launched fireworks and threw bottles at the officers who swung batons and fire pepper spray projectiles to push them back so in this case the officers were not instigating violence right they were protecting the the the, the president uh and the president see which you know they're sworn to do i totally understand that but in the case of the insurrection the police were instigating the violence so it's interesting to see right. how things shift uh and again as we talked about already um you know there's a difference of even why people are protesting one is based on the lie one is trying to find justice there's a whole history about that that i can't get into mm -hmm. i recommend james cone's book um um black power and black liberation uh i think it's a really good book that, that talks a lot about this and in, in, in some of the nuances here the last thing i wanted to say as well or maybe is it here or, or is it somewhere else let me see um no, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this in a few minutes. There's more to say. Average person to get a fair assessment of violence mm. in this country, political violence in this country, and in particular of January 6th. Tell us a little bit more um, about, well, I want to hear about the hearing, but before we get to that, tell us a little bit more about what you've seen in the reporting of this and calling this an insurrection, how the media has handled this. Um, I'm sure that's been super frustrating to you as a reporter I'm who sure it is. has seen the <laughs> other side of the situation. I mean, it's very frustrating um, because, of course, all of the corporate media reporting has been one sided. They have completely ignored what I just described as law enforcement, excessive force. Lethal force. This is the same media alley who went after Derek Chauvin, justifiably or, or not, and what happened with George Floyd or not, for course. months, alley. 
continue to conceal the name of Michael Byrd, the Capitol Police officer who shot and killed Ashley Babbitt. The reporters knew his name. Republican congressmen knew his name. Democrats certainly knew his name. Capitol Police knew his name. For months, they refused to release his name. Why? Because he was going to get death threats. Well, what do you think happens to every other police officer accused, fair or not, of engaging in lethal force? Another example of egregious double standards. To your point, Michael Byrd's name was concealed by the same media, who at the same time, Allie, was vilifying, demonizing Ashley Babbitt, um, accusing her of being a QAnon supporter. Okay, really quick. We'll get to Ashley in a second. And by the way, she was a QAnon supporter, just to correct the record. It's been proven. Um, regarding her other statement about, you know, um, about how like police were um, or how Derek Chauvin was 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 totally defamed compared to um, um, this officer who who shot Ashley. She said something else. I wanted to I lost my train of thought. Let me find it real quick because it's important to mention. He was going to get death threats. Well, what do you think happens to every other police officer accused, fair or not? of engaging in lethal force. Okay, that statement. The reality is, I looked this up. I, again, I found I found an article on this. This is done by a group um, who sourced, uh, his name is Philip Stinson. He's, he has his PhD in criminal justice. He's like, a, he's known to, to put stats together. The reality is that, um, I'm going to read the whole thing for you. It's a little bit longer, but it's important to realize. Um, updating the, the, the data is difficult and time consuming regarding like what happens to people who, or cops who use deadly force. However, um, Dr. Stinson was able to send this um, news site more recent data for prosecutions resulting from on-duty police, police shootings since those are rarer and easier to track. That doesn't include police killings that aren't shootings. So this is just using an actual gun. But Stinson told them that prosecutions for deaths like Floyd's are especially rare. In fact, Stinson has found only only 110 law enforcement officers nationwide have been charged with murder or manslaughter in an on-duty shooting, despite the fact that around 1,000 people are fatally shot by police annually, according to a database maintained by the Washington mm -hmm. Post. Furthermore, only 42 officers were convicted, 50 were not, and 18 cases are still pending. And as the table below shows, which I, I can put in the show notes, many of the convictions end up being far uh, for a lesser offense. Only five of these officers were convicted of murder and did not have that conviction overturned so so this idea that you know oh my god like how how do police do it like they're just being vilified no no it is incredibly rare what happened to Derek Chauvin is the exception by far and like to your point it's only because of the outrage of society and the media that we were able to get a conviction right. so I want to put that out there Another example of egregious double standards. To your point, Michael Byrd's name was concealed by the same media who at the same time, Allie, was vilifying, demonizing Ashley Babbitt, um, accusing her of being a QAnon supporter, basically saying she deserved what she got that day while that? covering no up Michael Byrd's name, who, by the way, no. has been exonerated by alleged internal investigations at DOJ and Capitol Police, yes. to this day still has his job. That doesn't happen in any other city, in any other place in this country, except for Washington, D.C., because... We just totally debunked that. I'm not going to read you the stats again, but it's, as we said, it is incredibly rare to get a conviction or to get a cop, you know, off the police force for shooting someone who's unarmed. Um, yep. Just flat out, this is just propaganda. There's no merit to it at all. Michael Byrd shot a Trump supporter. So who the media considers a deplorable. So her rights don't matter. Um, so just another example, I do want to touch on for a second, Allie, what you just referred to. The Lafayette Square riots in uh, May spilling over to June uh, 1st and 2nd of 2020. This is the most comparable uh, example to January 6th. It's not. You're talking I about people who are on federal <laughs> property, too. Lafayette Square's public park, um, who were engaged in violence with federal officers, uh, U.S. Park Police, and Secret Service agents that prompted the lockdown of the White House for days. These people were setting fires across the street, trying to climb over fences and attack the White House. Not only has DOJ actively dropped charges against those people, um, Congress held two hearings in the summer of 2020 to investigate law enforcement <gasps> for attacking these protesters. They held congressional hearings 
not on what the rioters did, not what happened inside the White House, not how Donald Trump and his family's lives were endangered, not how they were burning property and attacking officers with all sorts of weapons. Congress held a hearing about law enforcement. Um, Okay, I'll I'll give you your your, your thing. I I have a lot to say too, but just one thing I will mention really quick is that Notice how how these these protesters were endangering the president from like hundreds of feet away behind a barrier and armored vehicles. But the but Ashley Babbitt, who was like literally a few feet away from members of you know the Senate or, or whatever it was, um, trying to do their due their due diligence. Um, no threat there. No threat. Unjustifiable. Uh, completely crazy. These were the the protesters you know who were at the insurrection. They're just good people trying to be trying to do their thing. But these protesters you know in, in lafayette square oh my god it's it's insane anyway go ahead oh i agree um and i just think because she brought up this comparison i'm gonna have to address it even though i don't think that it's even remotely a comparison at all mostly because lafayette square is a public park um <laughs> we're talking about the united states capitol which beyond being a federal building is also a global symbol of democracy but anyway the protesters, the protesters at Lafayette Square were not trying to obstruct a federal proceeding. They were not yep. trying to engage in seditious conspiracy. They were not attempting to overthrow the United States government or and they were not attempting to impede a presidential election. Um, yes. They were not chanting, hang the vice president um, or actively looking for our speaker of the House. Yes. Um, and so it's really important, I think, to make it abundantly clear that there is no comparison here. Also, though, if we're going to talk about Lafayette Square and um, really what is, I would say this is basically all just built on white supremacy, this kind of comparison here, Trump actually requested um, that the 82nd Airborne, which is a division of the Army, be moved up from Fort Bragg, North Carolina and stationed outside of D.C. And he was intent on using the United States military on these peaceful protesters um, who were exercising their First Amendment rights. Now, this had not been used, this action of active duty military had not been used since 1992. Um, And the the Pentagon freaked out because this is a serious situation when you have the president basically using his own personal military, which is how he viewed the military, um, active duty 82nd Airborne, against protesters um the pentagon freaked out and they ended up using the national guard instead and it was still in my opinion it was um it was a terrible situation and the protesters had every right to be exercising you know their first amendment but anyway just to be very very clear on what happened here this was a a peaceful protest um, and is not at all comparable to January 6th. So she also mentions that, uh, you know, there was scrutiny on the police. Well, that is correct. And here's why there was an investigation done over what Julie is talking about. And the report found, this is done by the uh, Interior Department Inspector General, uh, found that the law enforcement agencies at the scene did not coordinate well, that the US Secret Service began advancing on protesters before the park police had a chance to warn them to disperse. So their rights, like you said, were totally violated because there was no communication between the agencies. That's why there were calls for an investigation. It wasn't, it wasn't, again, what's the narrative here? Oh my God, the Democrats are just so anti-police. They'll right. do anything they can to destroy the police. Meanwhile, Julie's entire case rests on the police being instigators during the insurrection. But that's besides the case. In this, in this particular you know, story that she's trying to paint this certain way. The reality was that the report found in Washington, D- that, that Washington, D.C. police, one of several law enforcement agencies on the scene, quote, fired tear gas at protesters and that the use of gas was, was a surprise to the park police, which was leading the operation. So clearly, yep. clearly um, uh, dispersal tactics happened before the protesters had a chance to actually follow orders. That's why the investigation was done. Oh, God, exactly. this is why it takes forever to get through this stuff. It's a fire hose. <laughs> it is a freaking fire hose of just misinformation after misinformation. Yep. So this is, again, the reverse of what uh, is happening with January 6th, but that's the most comparable example. Yeah. And then, to, of course, uh, just, to to, the just to underscore what you're saying, I mean, there are almost too many examples of this 
double standard, these two justice systems to name. But of course, as we have already mentioned, the BLM riots, the Antifa destruction that happened across the country, very no often of law enforcement Antifa doing anything at all, even few towns. the most like genteel response to that violence, which not just it didn't just threaten property. It threatened people's lives. I mean, people died and and were murdered because of this. I mean, some of this is federal property. And just to be clear, we already debunked this. There was, I think, six deaths total. So this idea that, you know, people were just dying all over the streets and the blood was running, you know, or the streets were running with 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 uh, with, with, with blood is just such an exaggeration based on the data that we have. And yep. again, I'll, I'll put that in the source uh, in the show notes. So you can look it up, but it's all right there. Law enforcement got criticized for responding at all to those things. And then, of course, there are the attacks that are happening right now at pro-life centers across the country. Of course, there's the assassination attempt um, against Justice Kavanaugh. And then Which left-wing made activists national did news. not waste any time that and same day handled. protesting in front of— What would you say? I, I, Justice Kavanaugh, I mean, that situation was handled. Um, the man is in jail, and we did increase security outside of Supreme Court. Right. Justice and that man also turned himself in. He called 911 and turned himself in. Exactly. The right is trying to make this sound like this was not taken seriously, right. which is completely un- untrue. And also, I want to say that I take it seriously, like pro life centers being attacked. That's not good. But I do want to say that since 1977, um, Abortion providers and abortion centers have um, been massively attacked as well. And there's statistics online, eight murders, 17 attempted murders, 42 bombings, 186 arsons at abortion clinics and abortion providers. So this Mm. is not something that only, um, yeah, just just, just to add a bit of, exactly. Yeah. The houses of Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett, where their small children are. I haven't heard the DOJ saying that they are going to investigate. I've barely heard a peep or seen a furrowed brow from anyone in the media about this stuff, uh, stuff, Mm -hmm. which is a subversion of a democratic process, by the way. Jesus. I mean, Allie, do you hear yourself? Oh, my gosh. I'm minimizing my screen. About the Um, Does she hear herself? Talk about a minimizing of the democratic process. It, it's. I mean, we're talking about January 6th, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Keep going. It is always when it comes to progressive forms of so-called justice, which isn't justice. It is always investigating um, the reaction to corruption mm-hmm. rather than the corruption itself same this is thing with straight school up boards. Nonsense. so the doj oh, by the biden in, administration is not concerned with pornography that is being Proof. showed to elementary schoolers but is actually concerned with the parents who are concerned about that so they are calling the parents there. concerned about that terrorist they're not at all concerned that the pornography is being showed talking okay, about comprehensive I, I, sex education yeah and also i need okay. a source on that i need a source of biden's doj calling the parents who are concerned about what their children are seeing in school terrorists like i need i looked it up i couldn't find it i was searching 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 i need evidence that that actually happened by the doj because if if, if the doj calls those parents terrorists i would totally agree it's totally out of line 100 percent. but again it's 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 this boogeyman tactic and notice also how how good ali and julie is of, 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 of taking other narratives and weaving them throughout. Like they really build this case of it's BLM, it's the school boards, it's, it, it's you know, mm. Biden's America. Like this is not about the January 6th insurrection. This is about so many other things that, that they're trying to bring into it as well. Right. Like in my head, I mean, I'm all for comprehensive sex education, but like, yeah. why, how are we talking about that right, right now? I thought this was about January 6th. Right. Like, right. this right. just came out of nowhere. Right, right, exactly. And again, I, this is a fire hose thing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I didn't have time to research every single claim here, but it, it, this is how it works. You just, you can't keep up. So, sorry, I just went on a rant there, but um, just to, yeah. just to emphasize what you're saying and to remind people, this is not just an isolated incident. This kind of double standard for justice is unfortunately pervasive, but please continue. Think about this, agree, Ellie, actually. and this was testimony oh, by one of the Go ahead. Yeah. I, yeah. I I don't know if I know she she talks about this concept of two justice systems throughout, and it might be appropriate to address it now. Um, sure. Because I agree that there are two justice systems in America. Um, I do not agree with 
who she thinks is being disproportionately affected. Yeah. Um, Brock Turner, a if you know who he was, he was um, I think like a, a, swimmer, a white think, college right? student. Yep, a yeah. white college student swimmer. Um, he got six months in jail, served only three months for three counts of felony um, sexual assault. There is, there is two justicisms. She's right. Furthermore, and I have a list of the unarmed people of color killed by police brutality in the United States. And I can go through this list if you'd like. Um, Jonathan Farrell, Dontre Hamilton, Eric Garner, Azell Ford, Timar Rice, Tony Robinson, Eric Harris, William Chapman, Jonathan Sanders, Samuel DeBose, Tanisha Anderson, Jamar Clark, Terrence Crutcher, Alfred Olengo, Jordan Edwards, Botham Jean, Manuel Ellis, Andre Hill, Dante Wright, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Mike Brown. This is in no way comprehensive, and it's only since 2013. But I would agree with her assessment that there are two justice systems in America. Yeah. Um, George Floyd was not given due process. Brianna right. Taylor was not given due process. Um, so if you want to talk about the two justice systems in America, we can go there. But well, it is. And don't forget, too, you know, like uh, Ali, Candace, Ben, Matt, they did their damnedest to make it seem like ben, like, like uh, George Floyd deserved that. I mean, I, I did a response video to Candace Owens a while ago about this when she is like literally dehumanizing George Floyd so much, trying to make it seem like him begging for his mom and being on and having his neck. Um, uh, or having the, the 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 boot of an officer on his neck was somehow like deserved because that's what they do. They dehumanize whenever it fits them. But when it comes right. to their own problems, suddenly that that's impossible to do. Like like Trump was Trump responsible for this? He wasn't that bad. He did so much good for the country. I mean, it's just it's crazy to see how how this works in real time. Well, in the villainization of people of color as justification for police brutality, yes, yes. is nothing new and is rampant in um, within the religious right. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it doesn't matter what what the person did if they died at the hands of law enforcement unjustly, they were not given due process. And Ali seems to really care about due process. Yes, no, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to mention it, but the book, The New Jim Crow, is obviously quite the read uh, for yep. anyone who wants to know the data, um, how disproportionate the mass incarceration system is, uh, specifically Absolutely. towards Black men for nonviolent crimes. You know, even even going back to uh, to the war on drugs. I mean, intentionally right. targeting Black communities. It, 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 the evidence is all there, and it is very frustrating to hear Ali all of a sudden super concerned about due process when people mm. for years and decades and decades have been saying, "Hey." Black Americans are not getting fair due process. Hey, the laws uh, of, of how criminal statutes work are bent towards giving them harsher sentences. And Ali goes, oh, no, that doesn't exist. Systemic racism, yep, exactly. racism doesn't exist. Law and order, law and order, law and order. Well, and, and Black Americans make up 13% of the population, but are killed at more than twice the rate of white Americans by at the hands of police. Right, um, right. And so there are, there are two justice systems. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. FBI lead officials for the FBI when she was asked how many people from the 2020 riots, riots that took place for months in some cities. Oh, another I ad. I told you if we broke attendance record. I'm not giving them any of my, my uh, promotion. Destructive $2 billion in property damage. She was directly asked. So, so she was. He's, she's talking about the BLM um, uh, protests and that they caused two billion dollars in property damage. The actual estimate is between one and two billion dollars. It's not fully confirmed yet. Uh, but again, we know, as we said, that they were ninety-seven percent peaceful, which is a, mm -hmm. which is anyway. It's it's such a it's such, like you said, it's such an apple and oranges comparison that we're even right. having this conversation. Many people had been charged, federally charged, related to the twenty twenty riots. Her answer. 250. We now have over 830 Americans who have been criminally charged. Still new arrests. I just got a text today. Two more people arrested today. Almost 18 months later, this FBI, this DOJ are rounding up Americans on mostly misdemeanor charges, by the way, like parading in the Capitol. You have. Okay, I have to pause here. 
I don't think she realizes that she just proved kind of our point. Right. Like, yes, the BLM protests were immensely peaceful. And by the way, the actual number is 300 people crossing over 29 states. So it's, it's not 250. And yes, the insurrection was incredibly violent. And also, like, like you said it so well earlier, Riley, where it's like we're comparing apples and oranges. People exercising their First Amendment right right and being able to protest and then and then um law enforcement perhaps arresting people when things get out of hand is so different than people calling themselves patriots who are backed right. by large hate groups like proud boys and oath mm. keepers and we're seeing again evidence from the committee that this stuff was planned and also that the president was well aware of what's happening and right. knew that the election fraud narrative that he pushed was total bullshit but he still did right that's such a different um, um, motivation for what actually happened. And of course, it's way more violent. It's that much Absolutely. more violent. That's what makes this so damaging. But in her mind, she's trying to flip it to say, see, see, this is not this is not justice. Like the the the, the Biden administration is super soft on, on those terrorists, Black Lives Matter, right. but they're <laughs> super harsh on those patriots mm. trying to just take America back from the tyranny of the Democrats. I mean, that, that, that I'm filling in the blanks for the audience so they understand what she's actually saying. I also think it's just really important because she keeps trying to, and I don't know, I don't understand why, um, well, I think it is probably undergirded by a level of white supremacy, but she keeps trying to conflate the insurrection on the United States Capitol with particularly Black Lives Matter protests. Now, right. the United States has a rich history of protests. It's basically baked into our Constitution in the form of the First Amendment, the right to peacefully assemble, the right to free speech. So she is like targeting Black Lives Matter protests, but she keeps conflating these two. And it's important to realize that never in American history has the United oh, States sorry. Capitol um, been attempted to be overtaken. Thank and you. so there is just no comparison between yes. protests, which have a rich history in the American tradition, and a, a, an insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. There's no correlation here. Yes, you're right. This is un precedented in our nation's history. This has never happened before. This has never been attempted before. And also, even the idea of the vice president being able to overturn a certification is complete nonsense, or else every vice president would overturn the certification if they lost. You know, it's like this whole this whole narrative is is historically like an unprecedented moment. But people like Julian Alley are all about trying to minimize this while while really trying to um to blow up things that that, that america has a, a rich history of mm, it's a great exactly. point 30 and counting americans charged for a four-hour disturbance at the capitol almost four 18 hour. months ago and 250 charged federally for months of destructive deadly riots in 2020 that alley is what people get the most upset about and this committee can continue its performance art, but performance Americans art. still <laughs> see cities, areas, uh, neighborhoods, and cities back, that are Riley. still burned out. Businesses that have never recovered from what happened over two years ago. That's what Americans want accountability for. They certainly want people who acted violently on January 6th to be prosecuted, but also to be treated fairly. You have people accused of assaulting a police officer, pepper spraying, or even pepper spraying in the direction of a police officer, who've been in jail now for 16 months awaiting trial. They're yeah. not even convicted of so anything. no due process. Zero. So I want to mention right. that right. in altercations, which what she's describing is an altercation with law enforcement, right? Some form of whether it was trying to spray pepper spray or whatever. So she's describing an altercation with law enforcement. And by and large, altercations with law enforcement for people of color have not ended with them being in jail, but they have ended deadly. Yeah. So absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, again, there is, it's just a delusion. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would also like some names here. Like I, 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 I every name that, that she gives, I, I tried to research. I haven't found anyone yet in the names that she's given of people who have, have been in the situation for, doing something that is not violent or like, or incredibly egregious. Right. So I, I just don't know who, who she's talking about here. So I guess we have to take her word for it. But given her history in this episode of being mm. so disingenuous, it's so hard to believe her. 
Meanwhile, all the rioters, they're dropping, DOJ is dropping charges. They're asking for leniency. We just saw this in the case of two lawyers in New York yeah. City who put together that Molotov cocktail that they threw at a, a, a police vehicle. 18 to 24 months. That's half the sentence that this government handed down against Jacob Chansley, the guy <laughs> with the horns and the fur and the, and the face paint, um, who walked in the building, talked to police officers, who followed him into the Senate gallery. He led a prayer. He let it, left a note for Mike Pence. No weapon, didn't attack anyone, no property. He will be in jail for 41 months after serving 317 days in solitary confinement. This DOJ. Okay, so I couldn't fully fact check her claim about him being in solitary confinement for that long. I have found several articles about what's known as like the six or this, the Sixers, which is where um, the police in DC have put the people that they've arrested who are staying in prison right now. Um, I, according to articles, they are able to hang out at times. They have several hours of free time. They have Bible study together, et cetera. Now, the other thing I want to mention, and again, I, I couldn't fully confirm this because there is some reports as well of people being in solitary confinement. But one of the reasons I, I'm not saying this is for everyone. And again, I want to be clear. I can't confirm this is the case of uh, what's this guy's name? Is it Jacob? Is that what his name is? The, mm -hmm. uh, the, the shaman guy um, is that a lot of them would not get vaccinated. So they, so they wouldn't put them in general population or let them spend a lot of time with other people because they would not get vaccinated during the pandemic. When it, again, have a yeah, don't, and don't forget, a, a year ago, a year right. ago, that was a big deal. Like that was, it was really spreading. Yeah, so um, some of the quotes I have here, um, uh, let's see, most of the Sixers existence goes down in isolation. The cells on Charlie 2 Bravo are singles. Each day they get a five and a half hour window of rec time outside the cell. One day it's from 9 a.m. to 2.30 and then it rotates. Um, they they sing the national anthem in unison at 9 p.m., um, et cetera. So, so again, the, the, the image you get is almost like Guantanamo Bay, right? Mm. Like, oh my God, these right. prisoners of war waterboarded. They're not seeing sunlight. And every now and then they can go pee. You know, and again, I'm not saying that, that 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 there might not be an example or two of that, but that that seems incredibly disingenuous based on what I was able to find. One other thing I want to mention about this, too, is that both the Times and Senator Elizabeth Warren were outspoken and said that's that that um, that solitary confinement for the uh, January 6th insurrectionists is cruel punishment. And they actually right. fought against it. So again, this idea that the Democrats are just trying to really rub it in and just punish these people, that narrative gets blown up when Senator Warren, one of the most prominent Democrats, right? Yeah, says, very progressive. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, I do not support these people not given their rights or being in segregation right. or, um, or being in solitary confinement because it is cruel and it is not good. The Time article, same thing. It's called, uh, quote, why it's critical that January 6th rioters' rights are respected. So certainly there are articles about the importance of protecting their rights. I just want to point that out there. Yeah, I totally agree. Can finally find tortured him into a plea deal. Yep. Tortured, yeah. He How was many people are in solitary confinement because of this? Do you know? So it varies, Ali. What happened early on is there were solitary confinement conditions. This was men, especially in this D.C. jail. We have a political prison in Washington, D.C., just astonishing. This is part of the yeah, D.C. jail political. that is set aside Are specifically for oh, people gosh. who protested Joe Biden's election who are being that is correct. OK. And the reason why I have I have, again, just look this up. But I will gladly read it to you. Um, let's see. It says here the jail. OK, so the 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 jail is three percent of the inmates on average are white, while 87 percent are black. What happens inside when you lock up dozens of overwhelmingly white men arrested as part of a radical right wing insurrection? I and mean, don't forget. That, that's a great question. I mean, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, these are not friendly to, my, to racial right. minorities. The jail's overseers decided they did not want to find out. So they, they confined all of them to a medium security annex away from other prisoners. That makes complete sense. That makes complete right. sense. But again, the way she spins it, right, is this political internment camp, you know, propped up by the Biden administration to punish these people. No, there are reasons behind why they did what they did. Absolutely.
prosecuted by Joe Biden's Justice Department. Um, so there are right now about 40 men who are still in this D.C. jail. Many of them have spent lengthy amounts of time in solitary uh, confinement conditions, only allowed out of their cell for an hour at a time. They can't shower. Um, they had no access to any personal hygiene, care, shaving, etc. I couldn't they find can't any speak evidence to their of this. Lawyers. I, I, they I can't get I access can to their uh, discovery materials we against them. Oh, How is yeah. this legal? But totally. Is it legal? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I just, I really want to highlight the fact that this Julie Kelly is um, calling attention to the problems within our mm. incarceral system. Yeah. She's not the first person to do this, though. And mm. I find it very interesting that she is bringing this to light on behalf of white supremacist organizations, on behalf of yes. the Proud Boys are listed as a terrorist organization in Canada. This is who she is, who she chooses to care about. When, when she cares about our mass incarceral system, it's on behalf of white supremacist groups, despite the fact that people of color have been saying this and have been experiencing this for decades. This is not new. This is yes. not new information. Yes. No, that is, man, if that is, that is so well said, Riley, that is just perfect. And also, again, this could be reality. I have not been able to find in this circumstance with these people, any evidence of that I couldn't find, you know, people not being able to get a hold of what they need to get a hold of. I just have maybe it exists. I was not able to find it in, in my my Googling, to be honest with you. So maybe it's real, but I, I can't, I can't verify. Cool. It's not, it's not legal at all. But it does. And you matter. have judges. You have judges as far back as the summer, at last summer, Allie, where I heard one judge, Judge Trevor McFadden, a Trump appointee who is keeping uh, several men held behind bars. Last June, he said he was worried about due process and Sixth Amendment violations. Here we are a year later, not a single judge has released any of these men based on any uh, 6A, 4A, 8A um, violations by this Justice Department. They keep going along, letting these men languish in jail while the same DOJ and judges delay their trials, withhold discovery evidence, and do not allow them uh, regular access to their defense attorneys. It really is such a travesty. It's hard to keep track of. I mean, it's hard to like yeah. assemble all of it to make it so um, you know, comprehensible for people. Yeah. But uh, I mean, this is a, this is a political prosecution with political prison, prison, and, uh, you know, like I said, new arrests every single week. Okay. Max says vain recognition. I think we should pause there because there's, you know, we, we're only like about halfway through and I think we're, <laughs> we're like two hours in, but I, I, I think that this is a good pausing place yeah. um, to, to kind of do a part one that we can come back and do a part two. Um, okay. any, any final thoughts on, on your end so far of, of what you've seen, like any big picture themes or, or comments? I mean, I feel like I've mentioned this throughout, but for me, the biggest theme is really um, is white supremacy. And I'm not calling anybody anything here. I'm just speaking of it as a as a generic um, as a theme that I'm seeing yeah. um, is is really the results of systemic racism. And, um, and and yeah, exactly. Just this idea that our justice system is somehow favors the left or somehow is just targeting these groups that were just like protesting this election. Um, I, I really do think that this entire kind of rhetoric is undercut by a lot of racism. It, it is under, it, it's foundation, it, it's foundation is a lot of racism. To be honest no, with I, you. I, I agree. I mean, it, what else, what other conclusion are you led to believe when all of a sudden someone's concerned about our criminal justice system, when exactly. for decades, people have been saying that it's not treating people fairly, right. uh, but they're, they happen to be part of the BIPOC community, not the white nationalists. I'm a good patriot, forgotten country. Exactly. community. Like, like we, you have to read between these lines because Ali would never come out and say that. And Ali might not, might not even be that self-aware to realize what she's even doing. But the right. reality is, is that she's standing on this element of oh my god these were just good patriots that are being right. unfairly tried um and our criminal justice system has has problems and it's like yes it has problems but not for white men exactly you know like you're you're, you're looking at it through the completely wrong lens exactly and i think i mean in a sense 
they kind of incriminated themselves by consistently attempting to compare this insurrection with the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw over the summer of 2020. Yeah. But I don't know why you would compare those two, but the fact that they actually were, I think, is even more evidence of just kind of the the system of racism that is so prevalent yeah. within this kind of rhetoric. Yeah, for me, my, my final thought on this on this part one is that I am, even though this is my third time listening to this podcast, I'm still shocked that Ali brought Julian to talk about this unsubstantiated yep. propaganda by and large. There are definitely some elements of truth, but they're they're totally put in different contexts, it's been a totally different narrative. And it, to me, this is like an all time low. Mm. Uh, like Ali, I don't understand. I don't get it. I just, I just find this such a disingenuous take. It's easily fact check. I mean, if me, the non college graduate, can look up these claims and see from not just one, but three, right. four, five, six different sources, right? About you know telling what actually went on. It's like exactly you can't, you can't be serious, right? But she is. So we'll see what we'll see what part two holds. But we are not off to a good start. Whew. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll we'll pick this up and we'll try and do another another episode pretty soon. Sounds great.